Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 15 Relief for the Holy Souls Nothing is more conformable to the Christian spirit than to have the holy sacrifice offered up for the relief of the souls departed, and it would be a great misfortune should the zeal of the faithful cool in this respect. God seems to multiply prodigies in order to prevent us from falling into so fatal a relaxation. The following incident is attested by a worthy priest in the Diocese of Burgess, who received it from its primitive source, and whose testimony bear all the certainty of an eyewitness with regards to its fact. On October 13, 1849, there died at the age of 52, in the parish of Olidoy, in Flanders, a woman named Jeanie van der Kerkhove, whose husband, John Weibo, was a farmer. She was a pious and charitable woman, giving alms with generosity proportionate to her means. She had, to the end of her life, a great devotion to the Blessed Virgin, and abstained in her honor on the Friday and Saturday of each week. Although her conduct was not free from certain domestic faults, she otherwise led a most exemplary and edifying life. A servant named Barbara Venick, aged 28 years, a virtuous and devoted girl, and who had assisted her mistress in her last sickness, continued to serve her master, John Weibo, the widower of Jeanie. About three weeks after her death, the deceased appeared to her servant under circumstances which we are about to relate. It was in the middle of the night, Barbara slept soundly, when she heard herself called distinctly three times by her name. She awoke with a start, and saw before her mistress, sitting on the side of her bed, clad in a working dress, consisting of a shirt and a short jacket. At this sight, strange to say, although sized with astonishment, Barbara was not at all frightened, and preserved her presence of mind. The apparition spoke to her. Barbara, she said, simply pronouncing her name. What do you desire, Jeanie? replied the servant. Take, she said, the mistress, the little rake which I often told you to put in its place. Stir up the heap of sand in the little room, you know to which the one I refer. You will there find a sum of money. Use it to have masses said. Two francs for each, for my intention for I am still suffering. I will do so, Jeanie, replied Barbara, and at that same moment the apparition vanished. The servant, still quite calm, fell asleep again and reposed quietly until morning. On awakening, Barbara believed herself the sport of a dream, but she had been so deeply impressed, so wide awake. She had seen her old mistress in a form so distant, so full of life, she had received from her lips such precise directions that she could not help saying, It is not thus that we dream. I saw my mistress in person. She presented herself to my eyes and spoke to me. It is no dream but a reality. She therefore went and took the rake as directed, stirred the sand, and drew out a purse containing the sum of five hundred francs. In such strange and extraordinary circumstances, the good girl thought it her duty to seek the advice of her pastor, and she went to relate to him all that had happened. The venerable abbe, the parish priest of Adoué, replied that the masses asked by the departed soul must be celebrated, but in order to dispose of the sum of money, the consent of the farmer, John Weibo, was necessary. The latter willingly consented that the money should be employed for so holy a purpose, and the masses were celebrated, being given two francs for each mass. We call attention to the circumstance of the fee, because it corresponds with the pious custom of the deceased. The fee for a mass fixed by the diocesan tariff was about a franc and a half, but the wife of Weibo though consideration for the clergy, obliged at the time of scarcity to receive a great number of the poor, gave two francs for each mass she had been accustomed to have celebrated. The two months after the first apparition, Barbara was again awakened during the night. 
This time her chamber was illuminated with a bright light, and her mistress, beautiful and fresh, as in the days of her youth, dressed in a robe of dazzling whiteness, appeared before her, regarding her with an amiable smile. Barbara, she said in a clear and audible voice, I thank you, I am delivered. Saying these words, she disappeared, and the chamber became dark as before. The servant, amazed at what she had just seen, was transported with joy. This apparition made the most lively impression upon her mind, and she preserves to this day the most consoling remembrance of it. It is from her that we have these details, through the favor of that venerable abbe, who was the curiart at Orindoy when these facts occurred. The celebrated father Lacadari, in the beginning of the conferences on the immortality of the soul, which he addressed a few years before his death to the pupils of Ceres, related to them the following incident. The Polish prince of X, an avowed infidel and materialist, had just accompanied a work against the mortality of the soul. He was on the point of sending it to the press, when one day walking in his park, a woman bathed in tears threw herself at his feet, and in accents of profound grief said to him, My good prince, my husband has just died. At this moment, his soul is perhaps suffering in purgatory. I am in such poverty that I have not even the small sum required to have a mass celebrated for the dead. In your kindness come to my assistance on behalf of my poor husband. Although the gentleman was convinced that the woman was deceived by her credulity, he had not courage to refuse her. He slipped her a gold piece into her hand, and the happy woman hastened to the church and begged the priest to offer some masses for the repose of her husband's soul. Five days later, during evening, the prince, in the seclusion of his study, was reading over the manuscript and retouching some details. When raising his eyes, he saw close to him a man dressed in the costume of a peasant of the country. Prince, said the unknown visitor, I come to thank you. I am the husband of that poor woman who besought you the other day to give her an alms, that she might have the holy sacrifice of the Mass offered for the repose of my soul. Your charity was pleasing to God. It was He who permitted me to come and thank you. These words, said the Polish peasant, disappeared like a shadow. The emotion of the prince was indescribable, and in consequence he consigned his work to the flames, and yielded himself entirely to the conviction of the truth that his conversion was complete. He persevered until death. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 16 Relief of the Holy Souls Liturgy of the Church Holy Church possesses a special liturgy for the dead. It is composed of vespers, matins, lauds, and of the Mass commonly called the Mass of Requiem. This liturgy, as touching as it is sublime, through mourning and tears, unfolds to the eyes of the faithful the consoling light of eternity. This liturgy she reads at the funerals of her children, and particularly on the solemn day of the commemoration of the dead. Holy Mass here holds the first place. It is like the divine center around which all other prayers and ceremonies cluster. The day following All Saints' Day, the great solemnity of all souls, all priests must offer the holy sacrifice for the dead, at which the faithful make it their duty to assist, and even to offer holy communion, prayers and alms for the relief of their brethren in purgatory. This feast of the departed is not of very ancient origin. From the beginning of the church has always prayed for her departed children. She sang psalms, recited prayers, offered holy mass for the repose of their souls. Yet we do not see that there are any particular feast on which to recommend to God all the dead in general. It was not until the 10th century that the church, always guided by the Holy Ghost, instituted the commemoration of all the faithfully departed. 
to encourage the faithful to fulfill the great duty of prayer for the dead, prescribed by Christian charity. The cradle of this touching solemnity was the Abbey of Colney. St. Odolo was the abbot there at the close of the 10th century, edified all France by his charity towards his neighbor. Extending his compassion even to the dead, he ceased not to pray for the souls in purgatory. It was this tender charity that inspired him to establish in his monastery, as also in its dependencies, the feast of the commemoration of all the souls departed. We believe, says the historian Burlot, that he had received a revelation to that effect. For God manifested in a miraculous manner how pleasing to him was the devotion of his servant. It is thus related by his biographers. Whilst the holy abbot governed his monastery in France, a pious hermit lived in a little island off the coast of Sicily. A French pilgrim was cast upon the shore of his little island by a tempest. The hermit, whom he went to visit, asked him if he knew the abbot Odolo. Certainly, replied the pilgrim, I know him, and I am proud of his acquaintance. But how do you know him, and why do you ask me this question? I often hear, replied the hermit, the evil spirits complain of pious persons who, by their prayers and alms deeds, deliver the souls from the pains which they endure in the other life. They complain principally of Odolo, abbot of Colney, and his religious. When, therefore, you shall have returned to your native country, I beg of you, in the name of God, to exhort the holy abbot and his monks to redouble their good works in behalf of the poor souls. The pilgrim betook himself to the monastery and did as he was directed. In consequence, St. Odolo gave orders that in all the monasteries of his institute, on the day of following all saints, a commemoration of all the faithfully departed should be made by reciting the Vespers for the dead on the eve and on the following morning matins, by ringing all the bells and celebrating Mass for the repose of the holy souls. This decree, which was drawn up at Colney, was well for that monastery as for those dependent upon it, is still preserved. A practice so pious soon passed over to the other churches, and in course time became the universal observance of the whole Catholic world. Purgatory, Part 2, Chapter 17 Relief of the Souls The Annals of the Seraphic Order tells us of a holy religious named John of Averna, he ardently loved our Lord Jesus Christ, and embraced in the same love the souls ransomed by his blood, and so dear to his heart. Those who suffered in the prisons of purgatory had a large share in his prayers, his penances, and his sacrifices. One day God was pleased to manifest to him that admirable and consoling effects of the divine sacrifice offered on All Souls Day upon every altar. The servant of God was celebrating Mass for the departed on that solemnity when he was wrapped in ecstasy. He saw purgatory opened, and the souls coming forth delivered by virtue of the sacrifice of propitiation. They resembled innumerable sparks which escaped from a burning furnace. We shall be less astonished at the powerful effects of Holy Mass if we call to mind that it is incidentally the same that is offered by the Son of God himself upon the cross. It is the same priest, says the Council of Trent. It is the same victim. The only difference is the manner of immolation. On the cross, the immolation was bloody. On our altar, it is unbloody. Now that sacrifice of the cross was of infinite value. That of our altar is, in the eyes of God, of equal value. Let us remark, however, that efficacy of this divine sacrifice is only partially applied to the dead, and in measure known only to the justice of God. The passion of Jesus Christ in his precious blood shed for our salvation our inexhaustible ocean of merit and satisfaction. It is by virtue of that passion that we obtain all gifts and mercy from God. The mere commemoration, which we take part in by ways of prayer, 
when we offer to God the blood of his only begotten Son to implore his mercy, this prayer, I say, thus strengthened by the passion of Jesus Christ, has great power with God. St. Magdalene de Pazzi learned from our Lord to offer to the Eternal Father the blood of his divine Son. It was a simple commemoration of the passion. She did it fifty times a day, and in one of her ecstasies she saw a large number of sinners converted and of souls delivered from purgatory by this practice. Each time, he added, that a creature offers to my father the blood by which she has been redeemed. She offers him a gift of infinite value. If such be the value of an offering commemorative of the Passion, what must be said of the sacrifice of the Mass, which is the actual renewal of that same Passion? Many Christians do not sufficiently know the greatness of the divine mysteries accomplished upon our altars, the feebleness of their faith, together with a lack of the knowledge, prevents them from appreciating the treasure which they possess in the divine sacrifice, and causes them to look upon it with a sort of indifference. Alas, they will see later on with bitter regret how they have deceived themselves. The sister of St. Malachi, Archbishop of Amra, in Ireland, affords us a striking example of this. In his beautiful life of St. Malachi, St. Bernard highly praises that prelate for his devotion towards the souls in purgatory. When he was yet a deacon, he loved to assist at the funerals of the poor and at the mass which was celebrated for them. He even accompanied their remains to the cemetery with much zeal as he ordinarily saw those unfortunate creatures neglected after their death. But he had a sister who, filled with the spirit of the world, thought that her brother degraded himself and his whole family by thus associating with the poor. She reproached him, showing by her language that she understood neither Christian charity nor the excellence of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Malachi, notwithstanding, continued the exercise of his humble charity, contenting himself with replying to his sister that she had forgotten the teachings of Jesus Christ and that she would one day repent of her thoughtless words. In the meantime, the imprudent rashness of this woman was not yet to remain unpunished. She died while still young, and went to render an account to the sovereign judge of the worldly life that she had led. Malachi had reason to complain of her conduct, but when she was dead he forgot all the wrongs she had done to him, and thinking only of the needs of her soul, he offered the holy sacrifice and prayed much for her. In the course of the time, however, having many others to pray for, he neglected his poor sister. We may believe, says Father Rossignoli, that God permitted that she should be forgotten in a punishment for the want of compassion which she showed towards the dead. However this may be, she appeared to her holy brother during sleep. Malachi saw her standing in the middle of an area before the church, sad, clad in mourning, and entreating his compassion, complaining that for the last thirty days he had neglected her. He thereupon woke suddenly, and remembered that in reality it was thirty days since he had last celebrated the Mass for his sister. On the following day he began anew to offer the holy sacrifice for her. Then the deceased appeared to him at the door of the church, kneeling upon the threshold and lamenting that she was not allowed to enter. He continued his suffrages. Some days later he saw her enter into the church and advance as far as the middle of the aisle. Without being able, notwithstanding all her efforts, to approach the altar. He saw, therefore, it was necessary to persevere, so he continued to offer up the holy sacrifice for the repose of her soul. Finally, after a few days, he saw her near the altar, clad in a magnificent attire, radiant with joy, and free from suffering. By this we see, adds St. Bernard, how great is the efficacy of the holy sacrifice to remit sins, to combat the powers of darkness, and to open the gates of heaven to those souls who have quitted this earth.